Okay, so uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Peter Godfrey Smith, who is the next uh, lecturer in the series on uh, philosophy, individuality, and the humanities. Um, Peter uh, is currently distinguished professor at, of philosophy at the Graduate Center uh, at the City University of New York. He grew up in uh, Sydney, Australia, and did his undergraduate degree at the University of Sydney and his PhD at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he taught at uh, Stanford, uh, at Australian National University, and at Harvard uh, before coming to City University uh, Graduate Center in uh, 2011. Uh, Peter's main interests are in philosophy of biology and philosophy of mind. He is also interested in American pragmatism, uh, generally in the philosophy of science and uh, various parts of metaphysics and epistemology. Recently, he's been very interested in both uh, the philosophy of uh, communication uh, and uh, individuality, which he'll, uh, I think, touch on both of those today. Uh, Peter has written four books, including Complexity and the Function of Mind in Nature, Theory and Reality, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Science, um, Darwinian Populations and Natural Selection, which won the uh, 2010 Lakatos Award, and recently just released from Princeton, uh, Philosophy of Biology, uh, 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 a review book. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, uh, Peter. Thanks very much. Uh, this has already been a very intense visit, and I've only been here for a couple of hours and haven't yet given a talk. So uh, we'll see what happens next. Okay, so the living world appears to us normally as a collection of individual organisms. Uh, and this individual-based view of life probably runs quite deep in our folk biological habits of uh, thinking about the world. And indeed, if we, if we think back and imagine the scene confronted in prehistory by sort of caveman ancestors, I think that organisms must have been some of the most conspicuously bounded and, and countable objects around, along, I guess, with stars. And that would have been especially true before people began making artifacts. So it's not surprising, I think, that when Aristotle, in his work, The Categories, wanted uh, some examples of what he called primary substances, the most basic kinds of things that exist, the examples he gave were individual horses and individual men. From at least the late 18th century onwards, there's been a keen interest in puzzle cases, cases where the individuality of a living thing is unclear, or as Darwin described one marine example where individuality is not yet completed. Recent work in biology and in philosophy of biology uh, now contains a large literature on uh, what sort of thing a biological individual is, how individuals of different kinds arise, and how to think about intermediate and enigmatic cases. A great deal of this literature came out of a pioneering work by the Yale biologist Leo Buss, a book called The Evolution of Individuality, which came out uh, just as I was entering graduate school and which inspired me along with many others. Most of the recent discussion uh, has been concerned in retrospect, I think, we can see it was concerned with what collects, what might collect the parts, that is the spatial parts of a system into a single living individual. So people discuss things like bee colonies, symbiotic associations such as lichen, uh, things like that. But individuals of the familiar kind are also unified in time. So you are made up both of spatial parts, such as your arms and your legs, and also made up of stages or temporal parts, you yesterday, you today. So individuals like Aristotle's man and horse persist through time as well as extending through space. Now one term in philosophy that's used for an object that persists over time despite changing along the way is the term continuant, continuant, continuant. Um, familiar living organisms seem to be reproducing continuants. They're things that come into being, persist for a while, may reproduce and eventually die. While they're alive, they grow and develop, they grow and develop, and when they reproduce, they make more things of the same kind in some rough sense as themselves. <coughs> 
So that's the intuitive picture. And this talk is going to be about some questions concerning individuality in biology that specifically involve time and that specifically put some pressure on this idea of a living thing as a reproducing continuant. Now, here's one reason why the topic is important, and this is going to guide various things that I say. Evolution by natural selection, Darwin's process, is a very important biological idea, a central piece of theory in biology. Standard summaries of evolution by natural selection say it's something that occurs when three things are present. Variation in a population, differences in how much organisms um, reproduce in that population, and heredity or heritability, passing on traits when organisms reproduce. Um, by this means, favourable mutations, chance variants that happen to be useful that arise, can not just survive but also spread, can become prevalent and provide the basis for new rounds of chains. Now here on the slide is a summary, a more officially worded summary of how evolution by natural selection works and how it involves these three ingredients. I won't read it out, but I'll leave it up there for a while so you can see how things look in detail. So that's from Richard Lewinton, a geneticist, writing in the 80s. If we ask what sort of picture of organisms a summary like that embodies, I think it embodies something that's quite familiar and close to a folk biological or intuitive or pre-theoretic view of what organisms are. So the summary has it that organisms are things that come into exist, they're born, um, they reproduce, making more things of the same kind, and with the favoured traits being passed on in reproduction because of the operation of heritability. All this is quite intuitive, and the basic ideas here, as uh, Lewinton emphasises in this passage um, in the material surrounding it are, of course, ideas from Darwin. And Darwin was thinking especially about animals like pigeons and farm animals, though also barnacles. He was thinking about, mostly thinking about, organisms that have a rather intuitive kind of individuality. What I'll do in this paper is put some pressure on this picture of organisms and reproduction as it relates to standard ways like this of thinking about evolution by natural selection. And I want to emphasise that the pressure is not only being put on these intuitive uh, uh, folk biological views, but also on standard ways of summarising how evolution works. So it's often been said, or at least sometimes been said, that familiar descriptions of evolution have been guided by a kind of vertebrate-centric view of life ignoring all the other kinds of organisms that exist or trying to squash them into a vertebrate mould. And I think that's true, and especially true in the context that I'll be talking about today. So here is what uh, I'll be talking about. In familiar vertebrate cases, animals like ourselves, it's pretty clear where one organism begins and ends, both in space and also in time. And reproduction is something that's fairly easy to see. So organisms from time to time make more things like themselves. So reproduction might be said intuitively and also in a kind of basic biology to involve two things, recurrence and production. You get new things that are similar to things that were around before, so forms recur, more horses for Aristotle, more pigeons for Darwin, and these new things come from or are produced by earlier horses and pigeons parents of the new ones. Horses recur as time passes because they're being made by other horses. Now that makes sense and it's embedded in a familiar summary like the Lewinton summary. However, that's not always how things work. It's quite common for things to uh, be different once we move from familiar animals like ourselves to other kinds of living things and that will be the topic of the talk. So what I'll do in the talk is introduce the problem in some detail and then suggest a solution where the solution will take the form of uh, a somewhat new framework in which the familiar idea of reproduction taken for granted in summaries like this is treated as a special case of something that's broader and that involves other kinds of cases as well. OK, before introducing the problem, I'll try to focus our thinking even more with the aid of a diagram 
uh, a diagram that emphasises the idea that biology recognises individuals at different scales in space and time. The diagram is due uh, to Willy Hennig uh, from his book Phylogenetic Systematics. So in Hennig's diagram, uh, circles represent individuals present at three different spatial and temporal scales, and time goes up the page. So species are the largest circles. Within species are smaller circles for individual organisms linked to each other by sexual reproduction. And below that level, on the lower right, an individual organism is broken down by Hennig into, into stages, which Hennig called semaphorants. Hennig loved to coin terminology, some of which has caught on and some of which has not. Now, Hennig, who was an entomologist working on insects, was very attentive to the importance of, of changes in form within the lifetime of an individual. A juvenile can look entirely different from an adult. Now, in some cases, what we might think of these stage, as these stages, these semaphorants in Hennig's picture, are only artificially bounded as change is more or less continuous. That's true in things like us. In other cases, there's a sharper and uh, more non-arbitrary divide between some stages uh, some kind of metamorphosis step in the lifetime of the individual. Now, I take it that a kind of folk biology, an intuitive, non-theory-based biology, is not particularly troubled by the fact of change within a lifetime. A caterpillar changes to a butterfly. Aristotle's horse and human also change a great deal, although more continuously than the caterpillar. Now, a person, a philosopher, probably might insist that a butterfly is, in a certain sense, a new object, a different individual from the caterpillar, when the divide between stages is very sharp and the forms are very different. Uh, but if somebody else disagrees and says, no, it's the same individual, uh, though it has changed some of its properties, there doesn't seem to be a great deal to argue about there. And certainly, the view that the caterpillar and the butterfly are stages of a single extended individual is certainly an available position. It's not something that involves some kind of contradiction. So change per se is not a problem. In particular, not a problem for the idea that the world, the living world, is made up of reproducing individuals which persist, reproducing continuance. So the idea which is important to a Lewontin type summary of evolution that can be expressed informally by saying, like makes like. You know, horses make horses, and particular kinds of horses tend to make similar kinds of horses. A, a view like that is entirely compatible with the fact that the first stage of a new organism, the baby or the larva, uh, is not very much like its parents, certainly in many cases. So the idea of reproduction and heredity and, and individuality as a feature of the living world is not troubled by that, so long as the newborn animal grows up into something that does look like its parents in, in relevant ways. Metamorphosis is a more notable phenomenon of this kind, but still not that big a deal. Okay, so, so far, no pressure. So far, folk biology, Aristotle, Darwin, Lewontin are all sort of more or less on the same page about what sorts of things living individuals are. But now we'll start to talk about problem cases. And in particular, the phenomena I'll be talking about uh, or using to motivate the main ideas of this talk involve a particular kind of life cycle seen in many organisms in which there's what's called an alternation of generations. And these are cases which interfere with familiar habits of thought about biological organisms in the following way. Rather than A's making more A's, horses making more horses and so on, A's make B's, which in turn make A's. So you get back to A, but only through a way station, something physically quite different. Alternation of generations is very common. It's seen in plants, fungi, uh, single-celled animals of various kinds, and some animals. Sometimes there's a compression of one of the uh, generations alternating, so you barely notice it. In other cases, there's more symmetry. And alternation of generations is often part of a haploid-diploid cycle. That is, as the alternation goes on, the genomes of organisms double and halve in size. 
Ordinary firms of the kind that uh, are all around us are a dramatic case. The sporophyte, the familiar fern-shaped plant, is diploid, has two sets of chromosomes. That's the thing you might buy from the nursery. It produces spores when it reproduces, or when it, well, it produces spores. We'll talk about shortly whether that's reproduction. It, it produces spores uh, by means of meiosis, where the spores have one set of chromosomes. Each spore can grow up into a haploid plant, into a plant with that genetic profile, where the plant is called a gametophyte. These are visible plants, smaller than the sporophytes. They do have photosynthetic capacity. They have, in a sense, a life of their own. Those gametophytes produce sex cells, which are also haploid, a uh, single set of chromosomes. And the male sex cells, or gametes, swim to the female gametes on the gametophytes and fuse with them. A new sporophyte grows up there attached to the gametophyte. So in some, sporophytes produce gametophytes asexually and gametophytes produce sporophytes sexually. So that's the, that's the basic fern life cycle. Is that a case of metamorphosis, which we encountered a moment ago with butterflies and caterpillars? Perhaps you might say that the sporophyte to gametophyte step, the one on the top arrow there, is a case of metamorphosis. No, I think you can't really say that because each sporophyte can make many gametophytes. Each A can make many Bs just as each B can make many, many As. So in a case like this, if only one B can come from each A, then the step could be seen as metamorphosis. One butterfly from each caterpillar. Here though, at both stages there's multiplication. So to think about the ferns, I think Rather than just saying it's something like metamorphosis, we should think about what it would look like if humans did something like this. So imagine that humans were all the same sex and we all produced kind of sperm-like stuff, each cell of which could grow up by cell division into something that looked like a giraffe, where the giraffe then lived its life and eventually had sex with another giraffe and when uh, the pregnant giraffe gave birth, it gave birth to a human. So that's what it would look like if humans had an alternation of generations. It's much stranger than metamorphosis. OK, so what are the individuals in a case like this? And you might find it useful to think about the giraffe-human alternation when asking this question. Um, well, one way of thinking about organisms or individuals in biology is just to ignore reproduction and think about the metabolic units, the things that have a kind of metabolic life, the things that take in energy, keep themselves going, and so on. And then we could just say simply that both the sporophyte and the gametophyte are individuals. They have their own life because they're metabolic units in their own right. The problem arises instead around the idea that an organism is both a, is a living and a reproducing thing a reproducing continuant, to use the term I used earlier, something that persists and makes more things uh, of the same kind. So let's now look more closely at cases like the fern. So A's produce B's, B's produce A's. Who, if anyone, reproduces? Now you might say, well, the new A is made indirectly by the old A. But of course the new A is being made directly by a B. And there are fitness-like properties on both sides. So a sporophyte can either be good or bad at making gametophytes and a gametophyte can either be good or bad at making sporophytes. If you think of fitness as important here, you can ask both questions. If we want to think about a case like this, of, uh, sorry, there's a schematic uh, diagram of the fern case. So you've got uh, sporophytes, which are diploid, two sets of chromosomes that give rise asexually to the gametophytes, which grow up like the giraffe human alternation case. They then sexually reproduce and give rise to a new generation of sporophytes. We'll leave it, just leave it up just for a second. OK, if we want to think about a case like this while making as few changes to our normal ways of talking as possible, and by saying, well, something in the system is a reproducing object, then I, I think there are five ways of doing it. Uh, firstly, you might, you might make one of the two processes, either the A to A step or the B to B step, 
the thing you call reproduction, and you treat the other step as part of the just part of the machinery, part of the process. So, and you make that distinction based on some ob objective distinction between the two. Secondly, you might say, well, you can just choose. You can either make the A to A step reproduction or the B to B step, uh, but that's a, that's a free choice. Reduction or subsumption. You treat neither of them, neither A nor B, neither sporophyte nor gametophyte as a reproducing object. You find something lower level, perhaps cells or genes, or higher level, something larger, that reproduces without an alternation. Fourth, you might say, well, A making B is reproduction, even though the word, even though the, 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 the uh, the re part of that sounds a bit odd. It is reproduction, even though they're so different. Lastly, I think in some ways, the more interesting of, the, of this first round of options, you might say there's a kind of entanglement of two forms of reproduction here. Uh, and two Darwinian processes tied together, where the A's make A's with B's as a way station, and B's make B's with A's as a way station. In the case of ferns, uh, some people might initially choose priority and say, look, the sporophytes reproduce, they're the real uh, organisms here, and the gametophytes are just a way station. The sporophyte is bigger uh, and longer lived. Not so with mosses, but that's how it is with ferns. However, the, the gametophytes sometimes resist the idea that they are not genuine reproducers. They can break out of the cycle of alternation, either partly or or wholly. So about 10% of fern species have gametophytes that reproduce vegeta vegetatively, just on their own, making more gametophytes asexually. Uh, in some cases, the gametophytes shift between making more of themselves and making sporophytes in the, new, in the next generation. Uh, in other cases, they're given up on the alternation completely. So in the Appalachian Mountains of the US, there are at least four species of ferns that have become gametophyte only, so sporophytes have not been seen for a long time. And there are also cases the other way. There are cases of sporophyte breakout. I think that many biologists, sort of working biologists at this point, might say, OK, it's time for some reduction here. Genetic reproduction or genetic replication has no alternation. And uh, that's all we need to pay attention to here. Both the sporophytes and the gametophytes might be just seen as some of the varied, pro some of the varied products of gene action. Uh, this person might say that parent-offspring relationships between these big things are not particularly evolutionarily important, so it doesn't matter if we can't work out where they are, because those big things are just clouds in the sky, dust storms in the desert, to use two phrases uh, taken from Richard Dawkins, who would have defended a view of this, who would defend a view of this kind. So you might say that we should just reduce the evolutionary description to the level of uh, competing genes and forget the larger objects. Now, this reductionist option is a genuine possibility. I'm not going to argue directly against it, and I can see how, for a practicing biologist, it's the natural way to proceed at this point. Uh, it's a way of getting a workable description that avoids the complexity and the oddity of these cases. Um, what I'll do here is not argue against the reductionist view, but use these cases to introduce and motivate a different way of thinking about all these phenomena. And then at the very end, I'll come back and discuss how it relates to the genetic uh, reductionist option. And the difference between the two approaches is essentially this. The, the, re the reductionist approach, we just go down to the level of genes. Uh, as a, well, that is, going down to the level of genes is a reductionist attitude to the problem. And the approach that I'll present instead is, uh, involves a strategy of abstraction rather than reduction. OK, I listed for five options there. Um, the other two options I won't say much about there, strange heredity and entanglement, both of them seem a little bit ad hoc, perhaps, as responses to the problem when considered individually. <coughs> But in some ways, the view I'll defend involves a combination of those last two options. And more generally, though I used to think, when I began thinking about these cases, I used to think that that was the list and we just had to choose some one of the things on this list to deal with the cases. Now I think cases like this motivate a quite different move. And I'll now start talking about that 
that different move. And the different move requires that we see ordinary Darwinian processes involving reproduction as a special case of something broader. Okay, so now I'll present uh, now I'll present a positive picture. Let's step back from biological details for a second and think very abstractly, not just about living things but about everything, about the world as a whole. As time passes, present states of systems of all kind give rise to later states of those systems. Uh, or strictly speaking, you might say the block that's the world at a given at one time gives rise as a whole to a block which is the whole world at the next time step. The whole present is responsible for the whole future. That's the general case. In some systems, of course, change is organised in a particular way where there's local responsibility, at least partially, where some of the pieces of the present block are responsible for particular pieces of future blocks. And biological reproduction, where parents give rise to future individuals, offspring, is one aspect of this. Let's get there, though, in stages, uh, get to biological reproduction in stages. I'll begin with a very broad, in fact, almost indefinitely broad, concept of just production, where production is seen whenever one object or one arrangement of objects or one system at a time gives rise to another object or arrangement or state of a system at a later time, where each of these things might be anything at all. Now, it's not assumed that the object can do this all on its own with no other causes working and there'll always be other causes and background conditions that are important, but I'm assuming that there are degrees of responsibility here. So there's production of future states of systems and objects by present or past states of systems and objects. Within that broad category, some patterns of production exhibit cycles with recurrence of forms that were seen earlier. So A makes B, B makes C, C makes D perhaps, and eventually this sequence gives rise to a new A. Now a cycle like this might be very short, where A makes A right away, or it might be long. A makes B, makes C, makes D, then you get back to A. The amount of cycling can change. So the, this, the fern cases with gametophyte breakout are cases where a larger cycle, A to B to A, gets reduced to a smaller cycle, A to A. Now, any form in a sequence might be seen as the beginning of a cycle, and whether a cycle is present at all will depend on the scale at which the system is being viewed. So there might be recurrence at a microscopic level without there being a return to earlier forms at the macroscopic level, or vice versa. Uh, from now on, though, I'll assume we're dealing with a particular family of cases, the familiar cases in which uh, we have living things as our objects, and specifically, living things that are large enough to be multicellular. I won't be talking about single-celled organisms. OK, a further distinction can then be made. Dividing cases of cyclical production, so some kinds of production involve cycles and some don't. Dividing further, some kinds of cyclical production involve multiplication and some do not. So either it's the case that from one A, or a small number, such as a pair, you can get many A's arising later, or perhaps you can't. Now, if there's no cycle, if you just have A making B making C making D and never returning, you might say, well, this distinction concerning multiplication is still available. You could have multiplica multiplicative processes of production that are not cyclical. I'm not sure. Uh, at least sometimes, and perhaps always in principle, it'll be unclear whether there's multiplication or not, because of questions about how to count the products uh, of the late, at, present at the later stages. So if a cycle is present, then it is uh, clear whether you have a multiplicative or a non-multiplicative system, because either more objects of the A type arise, or they don't. So the original A's give you a kind of reference object with which to assess whether or not there's multiplication as time goes on. If there's no cycle, you don't really have a reference object in the relevant sense. Another distinction. 
Some chains of production include a bottleneck step, and some do not. Now, this is one of this is the feature of the version of the story here that's specifically relevant, I think, to organisms like us with many cells. And I'll say a bit eventually about how the framework might be extended. But um, certainly in some systems, the presence or absence of a bottleneck is important, where a bottleneck is a dramatic narrowing in the amount of structure present. So in the case of humans making humans, that's the reduction uh, in the life cycle to a single cell stage. So you, go, you have a lot of cells, go down to one, and you grow up into a lot of cells, where there's a bottleneck at the one cell stage. Now, as in the case of multiplication, the question of whether bottlenecks exist in a sequence seems applicable in cases where there are no cycles, as well as cases where there are cycles. But perhaps those questions about whether there's one versus many or more versus less that caused trouble earlier also arise here in the case of bottlenecks. Anyway, I'm going to set that aside here. And from now on, I'll only be considering cases with cycles and uh, narrowings within cycles that reduce multicellular stages of organisms to single-celled stages. Uh, that's how I'll do it today, although you could extend the framework, I think. Lastly, last distinction, there may or may not be sex at any given stage in a chain of production events, where I understand sex very broadly here as any fusion of contributions from two productive lineages. Uh, now, whether sex is present will, again, depend on, on the scale at which the system is being viewed. OK, with those concepts in hand, we could say, the first thing we might say is, well, biological reproduction in the broadest possible sense is just cyclical production in a living system, which includes some sort of event that distinguishes the situation from a situation of simple persistence with change, uh, where sex, bottlenecks, and multiplication might all be taken as candidate things that uh, distinguish a chain from mere persistence of an object uh, from cases where you have the production of new objects or reproduction. So that's the first thing you might say about reproduction. However, the cases of reproduction that we're familiar with, the ones that guide Darwin and Lewinson and Aristotle, all have a particular arrangement of these features. So let's now start to compare cases. Firstly, and I'll compare the cases using the same format of diagram in each case. Let's look at the familiar human life cycle. In this life cycle, there's sex, recurrence, sorry, sex, multiplication, and a bottleneck. And they all take place once before recurrence and all at roughly the same place. So humans, whole human beings like us, make many gametes, eggs and sperm, which can each fuse with a gamete of the other sex to make a zygote, which can grow up into a new human being. Now, on the slide there, so I use divergent arrows to indicate multiplication, convergent arrows to indicate sex, and small circles to indicate the presence of a bottleneck. Now, I mark the multiplication step here, the divergent arrows, as the step where gametes or sex cells, eggs and sperm, are produced, because this is the point at which many future humans can have their histories converge or coalesce. Now, you might wonder whether that's the right way to think about the nature of the multiplication step here, but that's how I'm going to do it. Small circles indicating the bottlenecks are drawn at both the gamete and zygote stages, but I count this as a single bottleneck, a single narrowing, because you went down to one cell at a sing on a single occasion, and then you work your way back out of it once. The diagram is, of course, not drawn as a cycle. People talk of a life cycle, but I think it's good to make explicit the fact that recurrence is to a state that's similar rather than identical to what, uh, to what was present before. OK, so there's the familiar human life cycle drawn with a particular set of conventions. A case like this is very naturally described uh, 
in terms of reproduction by a temporally extended object, a continuant. A new human is a thing that appears at conception and continues to death with reproduction along the way and um, reproduction makes more of these things, these reproducing continuants. So humans, I think, are clear cases of reproducing continuants. Once we've isolated the factors that make this clear, we can see that the arrangement of those factors seen in humans is just one of many ways that those features can be arranged, even when all of them is present. So let's now return immediately to the ferns and draw the fern life cycle using the same conventions I introduced for the human case. So now there are two multiplication steps before recurrence. So before you get where you started, you have two events with the diverging arrows to indicate multiplication, both of which involve a bottleneck, one of which involves sex. So rather than before recurrence, one bottleneck, sex, and one multiplicative event, in the ferns before recurrence, you have two multiplicative events, both with bottlenecks and with sex at one of those steps. So all of the things that are seen in humans are present, but they're not seen in the same arrangement as they are in the human life cycle. Now, for me at least, the feature that causes the most disruption for standard ways of thinking about individuality and reproduction is the second multiplication step, the thing I emphasised when I did my human and giraffe thought experiment. Uh, without that step, if there was just one multiplication step, you could see a fern as a single individual that stayed alive and persisted through lots of change in its form throughout its life. So if, in particular, each sporophyte, that's the thing on the far left, could only give rise to a single gametophyte in principle, then you could see that as a metamorphosis step of an unusually dramatic kind. Uh, and then you could say that just as a human is an extended thing that makes more humans, although humans change in their lives, a sporophyte and gametophyte combination, that whole extended object, makes more things of that kind. Um, it reproduces things of that metamorphosing kind. Anyway, but you can't say that, I think, because in ferns there are two steps, not one, with multiplication. And just for good measure, both of them involve bottlenecks, uh, and these two things occur before recurrence. And that makes it difficult to identify a reproducing continuant in the system. There are plenty of continuants, things that persist. Any of those things could be seen as continuants. And plenty of producing ones, plenty of objects that produce something else, but no reproducing continuants, at least uh, in the familiar sense. So there's the ferns, and let's now move on and talk about another case, a case with yet another arrangement of these sorts of features. So this figure represents the life cycle of a particular kind of jellyfish, a Schiphozoan jellyfish. Uh, and this is a, a, a 19th century illustration by Matthias Schleiden. These are the, th the familiar kinds of jellyfish, the most familiar kind. So in, in this kind of jellyfish, there is an alternation, as there is in the ferns. Now it's an alter alternation between a polyp and a medusa form, where the medusa is the swimming form, the familiar bell-shaped jellyfish form, and the polyp, which is formed by development of a sexually produced larva, so the medusas sexually reproduce, well, the, produ the medusas sexually produce, but what they produce is not a medusa, but a polyp, uh, or rather a larva that grows up to a polyp, where the polyp does not swim around like a jellyfish but lives attached to a surface on uh, the sea bottom. Um, and then you have a, a process by which polyps give rise to uh, juvenile medusas which grow up and then, uh, and then sexually reproduce. So there we have in the Schleiden diagram a 14-step uh, picture of the Schiphozoan jellyfish life cycle. Here's a drawing of the essential features using the drawing conventions that I introduced earlier. So, in some ways it's like the fern, in some ways it's different. 
Before recurrence, before you get back to where you started, there are now, well, as in the fern, there are two multiplication events, only one bottleneck, unlike the fern case, and there is sex at the multiplication step that includes the bottleneck. So as the uh, Schleiden diagram, I think, nicely emphasises in the drawing, you have a step here, which is step 11, at which um, a single polyp fragments not into one... Sorry, does not metamorphose into a single medusa, but, but well, produces, is the general word to use, many medusa. It fragments into things that give rise to uh, more than one medusa. So you have a multiplicative step at step 11 here, which does not involve a bottleneck because there's no dramatic narrowing of structure to a single cell stage or something like it at that stage, as there was in the firm in their second multiplicative event. OK, so two multiplication steps, one bottleneck, and sex at the multiplication step that also has the bottleneck. That's one kind of jellyfish. In cubozoan jellyfish, in contrast, uh, which Australians are all familiar with as including the absolutely terrifying um, box jellyfish, the sea wasp, in cubozoan jellyfish, in contrast, each polyp metamorphoses into a single medusa. So you don't have the step in Schleiden where a polyp gives rise to many medusae. You only get one medusa, but instead polyps themselves can multiply by budding. So again, in that case, you have two multiplication steps with one bottleneck uh, and sex at one event before recurrence. OK, so we've now, in the diagrams, I've given you three different ways of rearranging the features. The human case, the fern case, and the jellyfish case. And, of course, many other ways of arranging these features can now be seen to be possible. Some of them, as far as I know, are hypothetical, although giving a talk uh, to an audience like this, I'm, rare, I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to suggest that something is merely hypothetical. There's probably, in someone's lab, uh, someone doing exactly whatever I say. Anyway, suppose you have one bottleneck step and one multiplication step present before recurrence, as in the human case, but where they aren't the same step. Uh, so in humans, there's one multiplicative step and one bottleneck, but they are together. You might have um, them as separate steps, in which case two features of the familiar reproductive events would appear and appear once in the cycle, but at different places. For me, it's the multiplication steps that are in some sense the most important ones with respect to identifying the beginning of life of a new continuant. Now, I think, I think that in part because of the importance of multiplication in Darwinian processes and others might think about things differently. And I wouldn't want to argue about this. I don't see that as something one could really argue about. What I do want to assert more strongly is the fact that it is these dissociations of the things that are together in the human life cycle that depart from the structure that make, makes thinking in terms of reproducing continuance um, natural and convenient when we look at the living world. Incidentally, it used to be thought, until quite recently, that there was at least one case where a barnacle went through a one-cell bottleneck stage without multiplication. Now, in most cases where you have a one-celled stage, there's at least the potential for multiplication. There was thought to be a barnacle in which there was a one-celled stage with no multiplication. It seemed that in these barnacles, which are, which are parasites of crabs, the barnacle is able to cross into the interior of the crab's body by taking it down to a single-celled stage to get through the shell, whereupon it then grows up again uh, into a multi-celled organism. Uh, so assuming that the normal outcome would be a single multi-celled stage inside each crab, this would then be a case where there are two bottleneck stages in the life cycle, one multiplicative and one non-multiplicative, uh, and where the multiplicative one involves sex. I didn't draw that one in part because uh, the most recent work has indicated, unfortunately for people like me, uh, that there is no reduction to a single-celled stage. After all, uh, more high-powered microscopic techniques showed that that was, uh, that was not so. 
and that the invader remains multicellular at every stage in its passage through to the interior of the crab. So it's not, as it once seemed to be, a case where there's two bottlenecks, uh, one of which is non-multiplicative in a life cycle. We could discuss more cases, but instead I think I'll now start saying what I think this all means. First, the, the point of the framework is to make clear and to well, express the idea that the kind of cyclical production seen in familiar cases of reproduction, like human reproduction, is a subset of a larger collection of phenomena, both actual and possible. So if it's, once again, the simplest cases, simple for us to think about, not simple in their biology, have a cycle where there's before recurrence, there's one multiplication step, one bottleneck and sex, all at roughly the same place. Now if those features are in, ca are in place, as in the humans, a good deal of metamorphosis can take place without interfering with the intuitive impression of there being uh, reproducing continuance as the units that are doing all this stuff. Sometimes there's no sex at the step that at um, the step with a bottleneck and multiplication, or, or at least no sex at a step with a bottleneck and multiplication. And this has prompted some people to recognise uh, distributed evolutionary individuals, large distributed objects that are in some sense one thing. Uh, that grow rather than reproduce through a bottleneck stage. That's not the way I'm going here. I'm taking it that uh, bottlenecks are a, a mark of reproduction. As we move further and further from a situation like the human case with a single multiplicative sexual bottleneck, we reach phenomena that are harder and harder to, to think about in terms of ordinary reproduction by a continuant. Uh, in a case like the jellyfish with two multiplication steps, there's some disruption of the familiar pattern uh, in cases like the fern where, uh, where both multiplication steps have their own bottleneck. There's more disruption still. So I think of all this as showing a need for us to take the idea of reproduction differently uh, in biology from the way it's been taken so far. Now, of course, in biology, everybody knows about complex life cycles. Uh, none of this is novel, it's well-known basic biology. But in discussions of evolution, a simple like-makes-like like assumption, a simple heredity-type assumption, is often embedded in, in descriptions of what's going on. Well, you might ask, you know, how is that possible? Why aren't the descriptions designed to deal with cases like this? I think part of it is a normal and unobjectionable feature of scientific language where you simplify in some contexts because it would be too awkward to say exactly what you think is there and what you're saying is close enough to being right as an approximation, and that's fine. Then when you're doing specialised work, you use a whole different vocabulary in which the problem does not arise. I think that's very common in biology. How would it go in this case? I think basically by reducing things to the genetic level. So I think many biologists, and I'll be curious to hear if this is what people actually do want to say, I think many biologists would say something like this. They would say, look, in Darwin's time, it was reasonable to proceed by talking about evolution at the level of whole organisms. Organisms live, die, reproduce. And when you do that, a like-makes-like like assumption, you know, A's make A's, is an important feature of a story. But now we can go lower and talk about evolution at the level of genetic change, and in all those cases with ferns and jellyfish and so on, uh, there is continuity and persistence at the genetic level. The genes stay there through all this change at the organism level, and a person might say that's what solves the problem. Evolution just is change at the level of genes and gene frequencies. Some genes do better than others, they change mutate by mutation and so on. They might do all this by having very complicated effects at the level of the whole organism, polyps and medusae and sporophytes and gametophytes, but it's not necessary to track those objects very carefully, um, or rather it's not necessary to track those objects with respect to their parent-offspring relations when you're describing evolution in organisms like this because um, the real reproductive action goes on at the level of genes. 
Uh, and we should note indeed that Lewontin's three-part summary of evolution, the one I gave earlier, can be applied to genes as objects. So genes vary, uh, genes reproduce or replicate, they're copied, one might be copied more than another and so on, and when they're copied, uh, they're copied very accurately, so there's heritability. And genes, of course, do not have alternation of generations. A makes A, uh, and then A makes A again, either does so well or badly. And I think that has been the tacit treatment of uh, complex life cycles by evolutionists for quite a while. And I think I suspect that would be an answer that some people might want to give to some of what I've been saying here. So what do I say in response to that? Um, here is what I would say in response. Well, one possible response is, well, we now have two frameworks. We've got two ways of talking about these cases. Uh, one of them reduces to the level of genes and one abstracts and treats reproduction by these larger things in terms of a framework like the one I've sketched here, and they give different uh, perspectives on the same facts. So um, what I'm doing in a way in this talk is rearranging or organising in a particular way uh, some facts that are usually handled somewhat differently, and the two frameworks can coexist. Well, in many ways, I think that's okay. I don't have a big problem with that, but I want to push for a slightly more ambitious treatment uh, of the framework that I've described. The new framework is more general, and in particular, what DNA does is another special case, a variety that's handled within the framework. So let's now look at how the replication of DNA, or what's often referred to just as the persistence of genes, let's look at how that appears in a framework like this. Well, it's a very tight cycle, a very tight form of cyclical production, and a very high fidelity one, where A makes A with very little error. Where when I say A here, I mean just a, a short double-stranded segment of DNA. So A makes A, then A makes A again. Now this is an unusual sort of thing in biology. Uh, in chemistry, I take it, it's a rather unusual thing. It's hard to get, using the machinery of basic biochemistry, an A to A event in this sense, the same making the same. What's more common is cycles, where A makes, B, or rather, A and B make C and D, and C and D make E and F, and then E and F make A and B again. So like making unlike with cycles is more easy chemically than like makes like. Now, some forms of RNA are seen as an important exception to this, and the RNA world hypothesis for the origin of life is seen as important for that reason. Um, so one way of thinking about how things all begin is by thinking, well, despite the fact that it's a bit chemically unusual, there is a self-reproducing chemical at the beginning of the whole process. Another way of thinking about things, including a way of thinking about how things might have all begun, is different. It's to say that the unusual A to A cycle in DNA, the tight self reproducing cycle is something that cells found a way to do, to achieve, in order to make possible the unusual function that DNA serves within cells. So in, in cells now, DNA functions, roughly speaking, as a kind of memory molecule, as a repository of information about the sequences of the protein molecules that do most of the actual work in cells. Now, DNA is not just a memory. It's also part of the control machinery. So I think of it as uh, something that was probably originally memory, but on which a control function has also grown, especially by the evolution of genes that make products that themselves function to affect the transcription of other genes. More importantly, the tight A to A cycle is not something that DNA itself somehow does. It's achieved by other machinery within the cell. Uh, it's achieved by enzymes in particular, roughly half a dozen main enzymes and uh, some minor players as well. And those enzymes, the ones that make it possible for DNA to copy, they require a lot more cellular machinery to make those. So I'm trying to put DNA as just one of the cases within this framework and a rather unusual case brought into being by a lot of chemical invention on the part of cells. So the unusual phenomena involving DNA 
here and don't provide an alternative to the whole story, but they are one of the cases the story covers. Another very different kind of case, which I'll cover very quickly, because I just want to hit on this and then get to the very end, is seen in cultural phenomena, uh, cultural transmission. And I would like to apply a phenomenon, a, a framework like this to cultural cases. Uh, now, at the moment, some of the phenomena, some of the features I've used in this talk, like bottlenecks in particular, perhaps aren't really that applicable to cultural transmission, the transmission of ideas and so on. But let me just gesture towards a generalisation of the framework. So in cultural contexts, ideas recur, uh, behaviours recur, uh, artefacts recur. We make more computers and more cars and so on uh, in a way influenced by what happened with the previous one. So you have, you have chains of production that include cycles here as well. Uh, let's talk about a simple case uh, where you have an idea that leads someone to uh, sing a tune which other people hear. So the cloud here is a sort of thought bubble. Uh, the thought lead gives rise to an audible tune which in turn is heard by somebody, gives rise to a new internal state, a thought in that person which leads them to reproduce the tune and so on. So in ordinary cultural cases... Um, you have, you have recurrence, you have production with cycles, um, and you appear to have an alternation in something like the case seen in the ferns. Now, when people write about this in the literature on cultural evolution, what people tend to do is downplay the alternation, the fern-like character of this, by treating the thoughts or the ideas or the intellectual things as, in a sense, primary, and treating the audible manifestations of the thoughts as sort of mere phenotype, as secondary, as not as fundamental to the analysis as the, as the informational side of things. Um, but um, there are problems with this. In particular, there's a problem that's highlighted by uh, comparisons with the fern and jellyfish and so on cases I've been describing. In the biological cases, one of the things that is disruptive to simple views of self-production and reproduction is the presence of sex. And I take it to be a feature of cultural cases that unlike all the biological cases that I've talked about so far, you can have sex more than once before recurrence. So in the humans, the ferns and the jellyfish, sex at least only occurred once before you got back to where you started in the cycle. In cultural cases, I take it sex can be far more ubiquitous. Um, more than one idea might give, might uh, share their responsibility for a particular audible tune, and more than one audible tune might share responsibility for a new idea forming in someone's head. So, um, in the cultural cases, there are particularly strong ways in which impediments to a reanalysis of the case that tries to downplay genuine alternation are present. That's all I'll say about the cultural cases, and it gestures towards the kind of generality that I want to, um, that I hope for here. Now, in many scientific contexts, generality is not particularly important. Scientists spend lots of their time working on particular pieces of a larger system. Uh, sometimes it is in scientific context, especially in theoretical discu in discussion. In philosophy, as I see it, generality is pretty much always important. It's a large part of what defines what philosophy is. It's a central part of the enterprise. So you might have a situation in which a, a framework like the one sketched here, which applies a single uh, apparatus to ferns, jellyfish, ideas and culture, genes themselves and so on, has more importance in a philosophical description uh, than, a, um, than a scientific one. Perhaps that's true. In any case, though, what I want to emphasise is that I don't see the genetic reductionist option here and my treatment of cyclical production as aimed at the same phenomena and complementary. Rather, the new framework is supposed to be broader and it's supposed to treat the, the particular tight cycles visible in genetic replication as an unusual, uh, as one unusual case. Okay, how are we doing? I've got just two minutes or so. Yeah, I think I'll just hit my very last point uh, just to bring uh, the thing to its intended uh, close. So, 
individuality of the familiar horse and man type is a derived trait, especially in large systems like ourselves. The evolution of individuals like ourselves of this kind involves the organisation of biological material both in space and in time. Now here I've looked specifically at organisation in time, at life cycles that make it natural to, con to recognise continuing and reproducing individuals and life cycles that don't. So why don't we ask as a final question, is there some generalisations that might be made about what evolutionary factors there are that tend to give rise to life cycles that support thinking in terms, in familiar, in terms of familiar notions of individuality? Well, a discussion like that is complicated and difficult for many reasons. One reason is the fact that we're talking here about the evolution of the machinery that makes evolution itself uh, occur. Um, so, for example, bottlenecks have important evolutionary consequences. They may make lineages more likely to generate novelty, but that's probably not why bottlenecks exist. Um, still, with those all sorts of cautions in place, let me sort of offer a few closing thoughts on this topic. The idea of division of labour is usually applied to spatial parts of an organism or a system, but it can also be applied to stages, including metamorphosing stages and alternation of generations. Over space, division of labour is a form of heterogeneity or difference that does not compromise collective individuality. You're one thing in a sense, even though your parts play different roles within the whole. And, and the same thinking, I think, can be applied to time. Familiar cases of metamorphosis, to start with, often have a division of labour, uh, for example, between feeding and uh, reproductive stages and also other tasks such as dispersal. A temporal division of labour is associated with special expenses compared to a spatial division of labour, though. A temporal division of labour is associated with expenses of breakdown and rebuilding. And sometimes a temporally organised division of labour can be replaced by a spatially organised one. Here I think it's important, uh, as many people have noted, that complex life cycles are often associated with simpler, which means here spatially simpler, organisms. And simplification of a life cycle is seen in some very conspicuous lineages, such as flowering plants and vertebrates like ourselves. So one evolutionary path has been a path that goes towards a large physiologically complex life form, like you and I, that has a simpler life cycle than vari various of its relatives and uh, likely ancestors. And that, I think, is part of what gives rise to the paradigm folk biological, easily recognised organisms Aristotle's individual man and Aristotle's individual horse, uh, which are the sorts of objects, I suspect also, back before Aristotle, that most induced us, when we began to talk and think, to talk and think in terms of subject predicate structure, a structure that has exerted such enormous effects on the philosophical tradition.
So I obviously have to so optimize different adaptive means. And uh, if this is happening, obviously, then you, know, you must be able to parse the whole thing that you can measure fitness in the stage specific way. And that, that would need to a way of sort of uh, saying what is the, what is the uh, correct accounting for individuals. Because the accounting for individuals leads to fitness measures and, and, and which explains evolutionary adaptation. Okay? Yeah. Yes, I think of that though more as something that exacerbates the problem than as something that gestures towards a particular solution. So suppose I agree with you, which I do, and think that right, if, if at both stages we can talk about the traits that are associated with fitness, then um, surely that constrains what we say about reproduction. Well. What do we say about each stage? We, in fitness, is usually understood in terms of differential reproductive output. And here, what we have to say is, well, there's, there's differential productive output. Uh, but because sporophytes are not making sporophytes, um, the currency of fitness is not a thing of the same sort as uh, the parent. It's not differential reproduction, but just differential production. And I think once we say that, I see that as pushing us towards this kind of generalization where rather than treating reproduction as a kind of fundamental, universally applicable part of the theory, we now have to say, well, there's, there's forms of production that involve making the same and there's forms of production that involve making different. And that's just how we're going to have to think uh, in the light of these cases. So I, I, I agree very much with your with your saying, look, an important sort of uh, indicator here is the fact that f fitness talk is applicable both times. I agree with that and see it as exacerbating the problem with the usual way of talking. Hi. The story of these going through sports formulation and then coming back and going, going through growth uh, as a result of its, uh, uh, as a result of the sugar in its environment, just, just the metabolism that it can go through, that's driving all these stages. It's a beautiful story. How does, uh, how does thinking about these different terms like multiplication and bottleneck and such give me any more insight into what's taking place in the role of sporulation as part of the reproduction life of, of the yeast. It's such a, it's a complete, beautiful story. Why, why am I to, to look at it in these terms and therefore profit? I don't know, I don't have a view on uh, how specifically it would be best applied to yeast, and I don't know nearly enough about yeast, I think, to... Sporulation is, is the in general, they're, they're is this this is a non-multiplicative step in my terms? Am I right in saying that? Well, it's non-multiplicative until the yeast makes any more yeast. Right. So the, the spor sporulation itself is not a multiplicative event. Right. So once you've only once it's non-multiplicative, I think of that as metamorphosis. So here we have a story about an important kind of metamorphosis. And the yeast itself, if it only uh, has a single multiplicative event before you get back to where you started from, it's just like people. That's just a, a, a situation where there's change within the lifespan of a, of a persisting thing, I think. Then you like using the yeast to support the model that you have. I'm asking, how does the model that you have help me to understand more about the yeast or about the sport? I think you just said, it's a lot more like people than you might imagine. Yeah, it's a people case. But yeast are just like us. One. Because you only have one, if, if I'm right, I'm here um, grasping my, for bits of non-existent yeast biology in my brain. Um, but I, if there's only one multiplicative event before recurrence of the form you started with, then it's just like it's just like people. Have one more before we uh, take Have you thought about the evolutionary transitions between the different possible arrangements of multiplication and bottleneck 
and sex and what that might tell us about the original problem that you introduced, which is individuality. Because when I read Leo's book back in the day, uh, I saw him as sketching a very dynamic process that led into the Maynard Smith's of Mari formulation for major transitions and yep. like that. And the key element, the key thing to try to understand was why did new forms of organization come about? Right. And what you've described is the abstract elements of a system that could be combined in different ways. And that poses then the question of how do we transition right. between those? Have you thought about that? I've given you everything I have. Um, this, 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 is, this is pretty much brand new, and I um, am thinking about this, but I don't have anything developed beyond uh, what, what I've what laid out. I'm hoping, what I would like to think about this framework is that it organises a whole bunch of things uh, that are not usually seen as similar to each other and it identifies relevant relationships within which um, questions about likely transitions can be, can be phrased. So at the very end of the talk I said, um, if you want to know why there are things like Aristotle's horse and man, a transition between a temporally organised and a spatially organised division of labour might be, might be a part of it. Uh, now I, I chose to mention that because Perhaps the idea is familiar, but I hadn't seen it in uh, Leo's book or the Maynard Smith and Zathmari books. I offer that as one, as one small piece. Uh, I, I, would, I would hope that there would be other pieces of a similar nature. Well, uh, please join us for a reception right downstairs, and let's thank you. Uh,